Welcome to the uh, last in the summer series for the sound of vibration measurements. Uh, today's is ask me anything. Um, over the last, I guess it's been seven weeks as of today. At the end, we've been pushing this. If you'd had any questions or even people have stayed on in the chat and asked some questions that were probably not seen by the rest of the group that were really nice. Kind of compiled a list of these. Um, to go over some quick answers. Much like after the summer series, some of these are gonna come a little fast and furious. So in the web links that you'll get, maybe further detailed explanations. Um, but we think this is a great way to start tackling, you know, it's always, always nice to chip away at things that might not be well understood by everybody or things that we repeatedly get questions for. So we've definitely seen a pattern um, and address some of these. Uh, about the modal shop, um, we'd been founded in about 30 years ago now, coming up here at the in a few months. Um, we're an MTS sensors corporation, and uh, PCB piezotronics makes and designs precision sensors. Modal shop primarily focuses on systems and services that support applications of uh, large sensor users or uh, anyone involved in metrology or calibration of solutions related to sound and vibration or pressure or, you know, proximity. There's, there's a lot of things that we do. As well, as we have a complete sound and vibration uh, rental team and uh, a lot of shakers and structural test products that filled in the gaps if you're doing a structural test. Um, hey, I'm Chad here, joining Bruce today for the webinar. Uh, so yeah, went to University of Cincinnati, uh, much like many of the modal shoppers here. I've uh, been here about seven years, um, primarily supporting the rental team and a lot of the structural test products. Uh, and oh yeah, so I'm my the race car fan and the golfer. And hey, so far today, so good. Oh, it didn't oh you change didn't it. change it. Oh, I changed it on the fake one. Oh, <laughs> man. We had our new likes and dislikes. I don't think they made it. The uh, I forget my likes for today. This is an old picture of me, but um, like Mitch Hedberg says, uh, every picture is probably an old picture. Um, I lead the teams for both rental and uh, recal services here, and I've been here at uh, Modal Shop for 21 years and uh, mechanical engineering by background as well. Ah, oh, man, I mean, is the presentation is going to be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so today's question, uh, we're just going to be kind of going through the questions and answers a lot. Some of them, uh, you may recognize your question, but it may be a little bit editorialized. We wanted to kind of make it as general as possible, answer questions that came in, yet still make it um, content future forward. So we're just going to jump in here uh, with the questions. And hope the presentation didn't change too much. <laughs> um, hammer versus shaker. When to use what? Yeah, so it's kind of a, you know, I guess, kind of a very broad question, but it gets into a lot of things of what's the best shaker, what's the best hammer, and what is best to use. Um, so think of them both as kind of tools in the same toolbox, where both the shaker and a hammer can be used. In some circumstances, in other circumstances, it may very well be suited to one or the other. Um, you know, so, for larger, more massive structures like your, uh, like a large machine tool or press or something, you might be doing a modal test on. That's where the modal sledgehammer is going to be more advantageous because we can get uh, more force into a big, massive, heavily damped structure um, of that sort over what is a relatively small and low force modal shaker. Um, big sledgehammer, it's about a 5,000 uh, pound force peak range hammer, for example. Um, whereas even at most, our, our highest force mobile shaker for a small shaker, you can still easily move around. We're looking at 110 pounds peak sign force, for example. Um, but even then, using that high force with a modal shaker has its challenges with stingers. Um, so it's, it's more of a what is your, you got to think about what your part is and what suits it best. So larger massive structures or on the flip side uh, to an extreme, a very lightly damped lightweight structure, think like a disc drive, uh, maybe using that little tiny baby hammer over a shaker 
um, in that case as well is when we connect a shaker to something, the stinger inherently is going to add some local stiffness and some damping to the structure. Um, now, if you have a structure that's got some nonlinearities and you need to more precisely control your force input to uh, run repetitive testing on it, that's where a shaker has its advantages. Um, and that, and you can essentially use that uh, repeated force of the shaker to well, understand your project and pull apart those nonlinearities it may have. Um, so not really any one answer, just more of a thing where it depends on the part that you're testing and what suits it best. Uh, and you may even use a hammer at first just to decide where you want to locate a shaker. Um, so that way you can make sure you're exciting all the shaker. important modes. Yeah. Uh, and not even exciting all the important modes, but that you aren't going to locate the shaker at the node of a mode, um, which will prevent you from excite, exciting that particular mode. Completely. So they're very complementary. Um, in some cases, one is certainly better than the other. I like this, but you know, maybe I should just do the only questions and you do all the answers. What's the <laughs> deal with a piano wire shaker setup? <laughs> First, yes. I think we want to talk uh, about a through hole armature design of a shaker. Yeah. So, common modal shakers um, with the modal shops lined up here, we have what we call a through hole armature shaker. So, essentially, what that means is through the center of the shaker, there is a complete through hole that a typical drill rod style stinger, or in this case, a piano wire stinger can be used. So that's sort of step one as a requirement to even use a piano wire. We need that through hole to allow the piano wire to slide down through the shaker out the bottom of it so we can then uh, preload this piano wire. Um, and so when we say piano wire, it is just that, just a steel wire uh, on, one, on one end of the shaker, we'll clamp it in the collet of the shaker. And then on the other end, we've got a little fixture that you can use to attach it to your test part. Uh, so why does it matter though? Uh, so the whole goal of a stinger is to essentially decouple the shaker as much as possible from the part you're testing. Um, so even a very thin drill rod type stinger, it's going to have some amount of lateral stiffness. Uh, you know, it's kind of got to, if you're going to, you're going to push any amount of force into the, into the structure you're testing. So a piano wire is a little different though, in that you run that piano wire through the shaker, as you kind of see there, the straight black line going right through the shaker as it's held here laterally. And then we pull a little preload on that piano wire. Um, the simple rule of thumb for the piano wire is to be a few times higher than the actual force you intend to actuate with the shaker. Just to make sure you're never going slack with the wire. Exactly, yeah. Because if you go slack, then you suddenly have this force drop out. Uh, kind of a jerky snap back when, when the shaker goes the other way. Um, so then essentially you can think of this as kind of a DC offset with an AC uh, force signal running over the piano wire as you're putting uh, excitation into your structure. So the bonus there with the piano wire though is that it is uh, being a wire has essentially zero lateral stiffness. Uh, as you're inputting force or excitation to your structure. Uh, and it's got some advantages of letting you have a little shorter stinger or even a longer stinger. Um, whereas that can be challenging with your typical drill rod or 1032 type stingers that getting longer or shorter can create some either buckling challenges for longer or increase that lateral stiffness uh, with shorter stingers. Uh, so another one of those modal tools, uh, Maybe you don't think about, but something to keep in mind. And as part of the uh, last minute edits, I was making the presentation that, of course, I did not call up the right presentation to present. Sorry. Um, I wanted to remember or remind everyone that we're going to be sending some links out. So a lot of times we have really rich content at Modal Shop and a PCB um, and at Larson Davis. And sometimes it's it's hard to find. You know, I think that 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 sounds trivial, but I mean, there's over a thousand content pages on the modal shop alone. Finding the exact answer can be challenging. So, with this series, when your webinar packet comes back to you, you're going to get links to a lot of the articles that we may be mentioning if there already is something, or um, there's a future that I really want to start building up a little more content here. So we'll keep you informed of those as well.
a question that we get um like a <laughs> uh, modal uh, it's hard to describe but wendy what's a modal shaker what's a vibration shaker yeah and there's like this question comes in a ton of ways it does yeah and you know, shakers whether it's mostly built for modal or just more this general purpose kind of shaker application as shown here on the right picture um you know they're built the same way a shaker is effectively a transducer um, so it's just kind of in reverse so shaker we take electro electrical signal and we turn it to a dynamic force or acceleration you know accelerometer is the inverse of that um so in principle they work the same way now what the difference is though when we get into uh modal versus a general purpose shaker is that a modal type application we think of the test part as self-supported or supported on say bungees or foam or whatever sort of boundary condition may be testing it. So the shaker is not supporting the mass of that payload. Um, and we're connecting to the to the system under test via a stinger, whether it be a piano wire or a drill rod or whatever it might be. Now Which okay. I will note, you know, we get forms of this question, and we've been asked forms of this question for this in a number of ways. And one of the challenges that we actually struggle with is uh, somebody will look at a 50 pound force shaker and somehow assume it supports a 50 pound object. And, you know, it seems trivial if you do shaker testing as part of your everyday job. If you don't, it's not. And like Chad mentioned, really, uh, it, it's two separate things. It's um, it's an unfortunate consequence of having pounds be force and in, uh, in a mass measurement in the English stupid system. So, uh, but it, it's something that we battle substantially and we get this question a lot. So exactly what Chad just said, the stinger is really not supporting any mass. It's exciting an object with a you know net zero force usually, unless you're using the piano wire tension type, or uh, or you have an exciter where you're you know trying to excite an object maybe to failure or to run it a, a number of cycles to make sure it survives. Uh, and that is another good point, kind of a segue off of the force rating versus payload uh, point, is that oftentimes a modal shaker will have a softer suspension system with it versus a shaker built to actually carry a payload and a stiffer suspension to actually carry that part under test. So it might be something tiny like the smart shaker there with just the sweet lightweight, phone. yeah, your old school flip phone on it, or it might get into a uh, shaker like the horizontal table on the right where you can actually carry upwards of 20, 30 pounds on a horizontal table to test. Um, so, you know, again, in some of these questions, we don't want to get hyper product -y, but some of the modal shop shakers can actually be used as dual purpose. You could carry, um, you know, an object under for test, a small light mass object, um, or you could use a through hole armature for, a, you know, a shaker uh, for, for exciting a structure with a with a stinger and, and some other shakers we have um you know expansion heads so you could put a larger object on the surface yeah many of our shakers that we call our dual purpose there uh, for example that shaker that is embedded in the horizontal table it can be disconnected and flipped up and we did since it was the clever thing to do it does also have a through hole armature capability so it that's where it's name of dual purpose comes in it can be used as modal or as a shaker to do component testing life cycle type testing and one of the questions that came in while we were talking about the piano wire that we'll address now i think when we say piano wire do we mean solid wire versus woven braided or twisted um it really it literally is a piano wire traditionally it's a wound wire it's uh it it, it doesn't matter really it, it can support the force and uh, it can, you know, the maximum tension. And uh, I think what we do is just uh, use a particular piano, literal piano string um, for our testing. But any any um, wire that can support the tension force uh, is is adequate for this. Um, next question: When's a vibe controller needed? Uh, this is often, you know, I guess today, real quick, 
I cannot believe we're already 18 minutes into this and we're just here, but uh, sorry. Uh, we have kind of phases. We're doing some shaker stuff. We're going to do some accelerometer questions, and then we kind of lumped them into some acoustic questions and then digital and wireless questions. So when is a vibe controller needed? We get this question a lot again, and I think this is um, even even shaker experts sometimes forget what they're doing and they just kind of uh, their brain goes haywire. Um, open loop and closed loop is the, the bottom of all this. I mean, if you're doing structural testing, modal testing, uh, think about a speaker in a room. It's an open loop. You, you hook it up to an amp, no control feedback um, that decides what the volume in that room is uh, and changes it. When the human comes in and starts adjusting the volume control to suit their needs, that's a closed loop system. The same thing is true with shakers. Um, shakers are pretty analogous to a, a speaker, actually. So, and that's perfectly fine to do an open loop system with a shaker. You want to know how much force you're putting in to your object if you're doing a modal or structural test, and it gets divided out from the equations from the matrix math to resolve the system properties, the acceleration, you know, the, the system damping and, and natural frequencies, things like that. A closed loop control is more often used if you're testing a product to n number of cycles or want to do a failure or something. You need to know at every frequency is the force you're putting in, especially in a complex noise-based input or a real world like road load application, is that force being matched by the complex system that you're driving? So the closed loop makes sure that you're actually putting in what you need to be putting in. So it's a different side of a coin, very important, but that's when a vibration controller is definitely needed. The same thing can be true if you're calibrating something. You need to know at what force you're putting in for calibration to see if your system's linear. Yeah. That's where so some of those example uh, inputs for that closed loop can be I hear a sign sweep where you're sweeping at a certain acceleration level or controlled by even displacement of the shaker uh, through a frequency range, say one octave per minute, uh, random PSD spectrum you're trying to recreate based on that road load data, um, or even a shock response kind of test. Uh, and you can even take that one further to a force limited vibration test where you're not only controlling based on acceleration, but actually limiting the force you are inputting into your structure by having force sensors in between your structure on the shaker and the, sh and the shaker table itself. And that's vital for like uh, satellite yeah. testing or something. Uh, but if you break it, you're... Yeah, if you have a one-time object. Um, I get this question a lot, and I know this is a sound and vibration day, but uh, we'll pick on pressure for a second. We need to measure pressure, and then we're like, the first question we'll ask, is it static or dynamic? And then the response back is often, uh, and this is a really key question. This question comes uh, a lot to us as pressure. We're a little bit new when it comes to rental of pressure sensors here, but it's true for a lot of measurement types that we deal with, um, acceleration, force, and strain. And the first question you gotta ask yourself, if, if you're unsure, if you're answering uh to that question, um, is the static element important for what you're testing? Uh, does your sensor type support it? Uh, natively, a piezoelectric crystal, which a lot of our sensors are based on, don't really do well at a true dynamic or a true static um, measurement. Let's say you took an, a piezoelectric accelerometer, you may be familiar with this. You know, we're in a constant 1G Earth gravity, we're chilling out on the surface here. And uh, if you flip it, you're gonna get a minus one, you know, G, or if you, uh, drop it on a bungee or something for a brief moment, you'll get that free fall or showing the difference between 1G gravity and the 0G free fall. So sometimes you can play with this and get a quasi-static sensor. This is sometimes used in uh, force limited vibration like Chad was talking about earlier. But so you have to ask yourself if that static component is important to you. Uh, does your DAC support it? Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about ICP and uh, DC uh, type measurements in, in, in a bit. Um, in acoustic testing, this question we get, this, this came through a few ways. 
Um, is there any advice on when to select the microphone array, a sound camera, or intensity probe? Um, these can be confused fairly easily too if you don't perform this testing often. Uh, a lot of standards call for measurement of sound power or sound power per unit area, which is uh, energy over time. A typical microphone array is often in a hemisphere or a cubic style arrangement. It's great. It's relatively low cost. Uh, and you can use it to test products and design phase or quality checks on an object. Um, a downside of these is that these are typically done in an anechoic room, which can be expensive but you can kind of see um, that testing objects either as a quality check or in a design phase can be pretty important in this way. <clears throat> Sound intensity traditionally uses a pressure pressure probe or a pressure uh, velocity probe. Um, it off offers similar performance and it can be used to test the standard as well, but the magic of this is you can test it in situ with, uh, without use of an anechoic room. Intensity probes aren't that useful if you're measuring non-transient events and um, spurry, like noise from outside events can actually taint your measurement too. So um, the whole point of using an intensity probe is just to test it on the fly where you sit. But you know that's a perfect ideal condition where there aren't crazy uh, noises exceeding what you're measuring substantially. But that said, both the array and intensity techniques offer a fairly wide frequency capability, and the resolution is determined by the quantity of points measured. Um, sound cameras you may have seen a lot of lately. Um, an acoustic camera, it's basically a tool that uses a microphone array and generally beam forming, but it uses it quite differently. Uh, an acoustic camera visualizes the sound pressure sources, and it's used for both steady state and transient events. Sound cameras generally have a limited frequency range and they don't provide any sound power data. But hopefully that's just a brief overview of what those are. Um, we get this question a lot. Is there any way to compare sound between two or more whatevers? You know, we, we don't want to implicate anyone here. Um, talk about clean. Yeah, so this kind of came up and we had this little aha moment the other day too for uh, uh, the clean snowmobile guys. So we help out uh, a number of the collegiate SAE competitions from Formula SAE to clean snowmobile um, and those that have a, a sound component or an acoustic component to their to their competition. So clean snowmobile in particular, they have to uh, meet a number of different thresholds from pass by to just a static uh, sound test, if I recall correctly. Um, so that's where when we help them out with the 831C meters for them to use, um, they can effectively use what we call the uh, reference spectrum on the 831C. So this essentially allows you to set a, take a baseline, uh, so to speak, and then you can compare uh, following noise measurements to that baseline that you put into the meter reference spectra. So for example, going back to the clean snow wheels there, uh, making their mufflers, maybe building some sort of notch filter in to to uh, quiet down a particular RPM that's extra loud uh, for that particular vehicle. They can take their baseline and go back and iterate quickly on this versus uh, maybe using a more complex system and having to post process and go from there. Kind of all built in quickly. Yeah, all built in quickly on the fly. And it really is handy for you know anything motors and anything uh, acoustic generating that you want to view some A to B changes on. It's really handy. Um, why do I need to calibrate a sound meter set when all the components are already uh, within calibration? We get this one so much that we partnered with our sister company LD to make a whole training video just on this topic. Um, the microphone meter and preamplifier all get a full factory cal. Why is it so necessary to calibrate prior to taking a measurement? <laughs> um, noise regulations and legal requirements may dictate it, but for good reason. Um, a microphone is a great combination of robust and fragile, uh, but more importantly, the environment pays, plays a lot of um, havoc on your microphone system. So testing right before and even right after a measurement ensures a good check from end to end for the system. 
not that it's a complete failure, but that there's slight adjustments based on the environmental considerations or what you have going on for your test. So we'll include a link, like I said, for this and many others with, uh, with the follow-up. How is the mounting method selected? This one is a very editorialized question, but um, people ask this in a lot of different ways and have asked this recently. Um, and I like to say, think of Franklin Covey's uh, seven habits. The first step is to be proactive, and you're already here watching this webinar, so you're proactive. The second step is to begin with the end in mind. So think, what are your test goals? Generally start with your frequency. Um, what are your limitations? Can you modify your object? Is there gonna be temperature fluctuations? Um, are there system challenges on a curved surface? Are there ground loops expected? Um, understand the methods and what exists to help, you know, we have, for example, the Excels, there's press fit mounting bases, adhesive thread. Um, but think about any surface prep you need to do, stud mount, screw mount options, adhesive or mag mounts. And there's some data that's a little generalized, but they really depend on your local structure and the sensor under test for every one of them. Um, the best generally is a stud mount, but that, you know, affects your structure you're testing. Um, adhesive mount can still affect it a bit. And if you're just testing something really low frequency, sub 500 hertz, a magnet might be a perfect thing. Do some trial and error in A and B comparison if you're able to on your structure and make your life easy. Um, back in college, we would do hot glue mount for sensors because we were testing modal on large structures that was sub 200 hertz. It was really simple and it made you feel really crafty. <laughs> <laughs> and also think too, just kind of a, a segue from the actual physical mounting. Uh, if you do need a ground isolated base, um, or if maybe even something that's case isolated is smart. Uh, it's part of what can uh, jump into your test there, which can be mounting related, is if you get any ground loops uh, that's poorly grounded, or if there's um, EMI, because you're testing on a motor, uh, that's not necessarily directly mounting, but it can kind of show its face through some, some weird ground loop from your mounting method. Um, and we'll also send a link to the, we have some video tu tutorials of both mounting and removal tips on our site, and they're really good. Um, and they're really shorter than this, so that's a plus. <laughs> um, the next one is a series of, you know, we have big dreams for this, and this one I think is something if I had to do a takeaway from this webinar, it would be nice for us to take, um, make more information. My data looks bad or my data looks funny or weird or wrong. We get this a lot and I, I'd expect to piece this a lot as well. It's troubleshooting data. Um, first pick on poor cables. There's intermittencies in cables. Um, if you're testing a charge mode sensor um, with low frequency component, cabling can be, you know, you point a lot of fingers there too. Um, but there's a link to an article we'd written called the trouble with signal cables, um, which has topics like what is a low noise cable mean? Um, cable problems that are in charge and voltage mode systems. But a lot of times, um, cables can be, cables can be a top answer in this. Other times it can get more specific. And again, no one really wants to share data too much, but if you have data, you'd like to share for inclusion. I think us making a website to help people solve data problems would be great. Um, if you had like an impact event, here's data from the same impact. Uh, it's hard to tell maybe, but the lower signal, the blue one, it's a lower sensitivity Excel. Um, you would expect that data on the same impact to be lower at the impact than the higher sensitivity unit, uh, but that's not the case. So it seems like a malfunction. We get this quite a bit and across a lot of events. Um, this one is on a published paper that we have. If you, this is very short, just at the impact event. If you take a step back and look at the broader time trace, it's a little easier to see what's happening here. Uh, this type of output from a quick input um, indicates that the input exceeded the accelerometer's measurement range uh, of the higher sensitivity Excel. And so what happens is it saturates the sensor's internal impedance converting amp. Um, if you do an ICP accelerometer, that, that stands for um, 
integral circuit piezoelectric sensor. I got the eye wrong. Don't fire me. The uh, integrated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so what happens is, even though you may not reach the 500 G of your sensor, it gets a little complex. What happens is the resonance crystal um, sends a kind of a false uh, high signal to that circuit to do its job, and it overloads. So what you'll see is a slow decay back to normal of your sensor. So this happens a lot. And then it doesn't just have to be a simple impact event. It could be a lot of events if you have a well-mounted sensor and you're uh, testing like a gearbox or something where there's metal on metal. And I think PCB doesn't do the best job of it, but we have a whole series of sensors that have filtering, either electrical or mechanical filtering or a combination of both. Um, this is great even if you're doing like human vibration testing, you're measuring uh, jackhammering or something that's highly repetitive, high impacts that are really short duration that can excite that resonance of the structure. Um, so we'll send a link to the filtered excels as well. And then there's a whole series of other bad data and how that looks good. There can be integration errors um, that can cause like a ski slope, you know, below seven hertz if you're taking your acceleration going to velocity or displacement. Or from just a shock. Or from a shock. A bias, a bias voltage shift. Um, the, uh, your, your data acquisition could be filtering something. Um, let's say you have exceptionally low output and here's where I'd love to make a whole series of web page with just bad data, um, you know, anonymous data so people can try to troubleshoot. ICP sensor plugged into a normal data channel without the ICP turned on will still output something. It'll just be scaled really badly and the noise floor will look terrible. Your ICP may be off. It's also important across any measurement system to remember that just because your system or your sensor measures low doesn't mean that your system will. This can get into a lot of issues like a 16 bit or a 24 bit system, um, you know, signal to noise ratio issues. Uh, just the, and even just the low frequency limitations of a ICP, uh, uh, built in ICP on your data acquisition. Sometimes those AC filtering will let me do about a half hertz. So even though a seismic ICP sensor may be able to measure lower. Yeah, you may be look at your sensor, say, hey, I should be able to measure uh, to one tenth of a one tenth of a hertz. And uh, get no output there or get really bad output. It's because your data acquisition is filtering that out. Um, and then just, yeah, in general, ICP and DC coupling understand uh, and confident in toggling to make sure the data looks like what you'd expect. So this one's a half answer, I think. You know, there's a ton of things that can go wrong with good or bad data. It deserves probably its own. Uh, and we've written a lot of topics. I have a few papers that I'd earmarked to send to everyone, but maybe taking a holistic view and gathering up all this data would be great. Um, why does my acceleration uh, accelerometer calibration start at 5 or 10 hertz? Uh, even when it's new, um, really, it just has to deal with time is money. Um, if you look at the excitation types to calibrate that are used when you're calibrating a sensor, traditionally we use that bottom center one. It's an air bearing shaker. It's very good, but it's limited in displacement. So the physics tell you it doesn't do well at calibrating um, low frequency, high displacement levels that are needed to get an adequate signal in. We use a long stroke shaker that we've designed here at the modal shop to calibrate low frequency things, but it takes forever. And honestly, on a paper or a, a calibration thing we did in the summer series, you have to ask yourself, what are the causes of the sensor failure? Um, generally, not going to go wrong with the sensor that wouldn't be exhibited, you know, above 10 hertz if you had a failure. Generally, the loss of hermeticity on a hermetically sealed sensor may be the only reason a sensor has trouble at low frequency and nowhere else. And that's pretty rare. And it's going to get caught at that high end. Um, so that's generally the reason. Sometimes the cost of calibrating a sensor to high and low frequency, the time involved, can exceed the price of purchasing the sensor outright. This one. 
this one isn't really a complete question that came in, but it starts out so many discussions between our engineers, either our field engineers and the engineers that are uh, here watching this. Um, and we get it. There's a coin shortage. But when those money pigs are staring you in the face and telling you there's no budget, just remember that rental often makes everyone happy. It doesn't affect your capital expenditure. Equipment's readily available. It's tested and in calibration. And you get the right stuff for the job. And, uh, and it keeps the money people really happy. So just keep that in mind with rental because uh, a lot of questions that come in, not just for the series, but in life, uh, in our data testing career, like I have this dream of doing this test, I can't afford it now. Uh, it's the barrier between the engineer, uh, getting over the engineeriness. I get it, I'm an engineer, I want my own stuff and being able to do a test, which I also wanna do. So uh, take that blinders off if you have it, talk to your money people, say, hey, this, here's an option I can use um, operational expense instead of capital. Sometimes we as engineers do a crappy job of becoming uh, bean counters. This one, we could go on forever and we don't have great answers, but what's the current state of wireless? Um, I found a blog when I was researching what to say about this because we get this question so much. Uh, generally, this is for predictive maintenance and condition monitoring. Um, nothing seems to be a great full solution, often due to power reasons. Um, the, here we highlight Echo Wireless from our sister company, PCB Piezotronics. Um, they have a great solution that uh, kind of wakes up if it sees an exceedance and kind of databases and log solutions. This is perfect for uh, replacement of kind of walk around monthly checks on equipment. This is always watching, you know, always monitoring, uh, or you can set it to wake up and start taking data every hour or every, you know, day. Um, solutions are like this. Everyone dreams of having a full frequency, fully capable dynamic sensor that's always on, but the challenges are pretty big. Sometimes people will make a wireless go between where the digitization happens externally near the sensor and it gets sent wirelessly. Um, we don't have a ton of experience with those, but um, long and short, I'll email over kind of some highlights of what I've seen for wireless sensors and know that we are, um, I think, slowly progressing there, but no great test and measurement solution exists yet. But I think a lot of things are made. Um, and honestly, I'll, I'll, I'll say it. Some of the solutions for the condition monitoring can be a little weird. They kind of forget some of the smart things that we've known from test and measurement all along. The sensors are designed poorly. They're not gonna take great data, but that's just me being picky for now. Um, and yeah, and then, you know, kind of a segue from the wireless sensor, we get to our digital product. So the 45B39 or the Digiducer, the 333D01 there on the left. Um, and yeah. each product, real quick, is, you know, you see at the end, it's just a USB connectivity. You can hook it up to your phone, your laptop, your... Even something like a Raspberry Pi, which is kind of that go-between that Bruce mentioned where you've got something connected to another item that kind of does the work of sending your data signal off to a database somewhere. So you know, they're highly flexible in that manner. They just use essentially a basic Windows audio driver. Um, to communicate, so that leaves it a very open source as far as what software or build your own software, or whatever it may be. You know, there's no proprietary driver for for using these on any number of systems, Windows, Linux, or any number of softwares uh, for that matter. Um, so probably the most common sort of question we get though is what can't, what software use these digital products with? Um, so up here on the screen, we've got kind of our quick list of what we call optimized softwares. So these are gonna be able to read in that calibration data from the Digiducer or the 45B39. Um, so essentially there is a, a sensitivity that is embedded on these devices that we can make sense of digital data coming over the USB. Um, so these are kind of more ready to go out of the box software packages, so to speak. Uh, but then from there, uh, you can use any number of things from LabVIEW to MATLAB, Python, uh, using the Raspberry Pis, um, or just whatever other software of choice that you can communicate with this device with that audio driver. Um, so kind of to highlight a few, uh, Spectra Plus uh, and uh, 
the signal scope are kind of a couple of uh, real popular ones, in particular for the 45 B39, just from their turnkey capability to hit the ground run with any number of different ICP sensor types. And again, you know, I think we talked Digiducer, but the 45 B39, that product, again, we had a whole web series on in this summer series, which is available for on demand. What that does is lets you use any legacy ICP transducer, you know, a microphone, a dynamic strain sensor, an accelerometer, um, in, in a series of two channels, and it'll digitize it um, itself. So it's yeah. a sister product. And the nice thing about them is that they don't use drivers or anything. You just hook it up to anything and it's taking data. Yeah, I mean, essentially, um, you know, they need, as long as you have software interface to deal with that stream coming in, yet yeah, you're effectively ready to go from just powering it over any regular USB and no additional power is needed. So your typical USB port on your PC or with the right adapter to your, for example, and you can start measuring. Uh, you know, another common question we get with both of these uh, is kind of, what is the sensitivity? Because a lot of us are used to seeing, okay, I've got a sensor, I have a millivolt per G, I'm gonna plug that into my sensor and it, and it does all the magic for me. I mean, you know, it's a little different looking at something that has the A to D built into the sensor already, like the Digiducer, for example, where we've got this digital stream of data coming over. Um, so with that, uh, you know, the traditional analog sensitivity, like a millivolt per G, uh, for example, not the best to really present that data. Uh, so the uh, just using the Digiducer for a quick example here, we actually use a digital count uh, per engineering unit. So. Uh, typically based on the 24-bit resolution at the 100 hertz point. So essentially we'll have a number of digital counts per per G or per meter per second square. Um, and then we can uh, essentially use that next scaling factor of the actual transducer built in to get to your final engineering unit. Uh, the 45B39 is similar, but since we don't actually have the sensor built in, it's simply just uh, the digital counts per volts peak. So that again, once we connect our actual sensor up, and we know the sensitivity of whatever it is, whether it's a pressure sensor, a accelerometer, a force transducer, we can then get to our, our final uh, engineering unit using that counts per volt. We've got our millivolt per G per pound force, whatever it may be. Um, so a little, little weird, a little different, um, but just kind of a different stage and maybe what we're used to thinking about from a traditional acquisition system. And we do have, uh, which we'll send this out also, we do have a number of documents uh, we've kind of collected uh, in a GitHub page that covers in more detail uh, how the sensitivity is measured uh, so that if you're creating your own piece of software, custom software, you can understand a little more in depth uh, and even some example kind of startup code, code yeah. uh, for a number of different uh, languages. So we'll send that out as well. And so I'd say to remember that a lot of team, teams here at Modal Shop publish newsletters full of rich content between the metrology, the Cal team, um, structural test products teams, sound and vibration rental teams, us, um, but in addition to other groups here. Um, chances are any question you may have, others may have it too. Keep sending us questions, we love them. Um, even during the webinar, a few more questions streamed in. Um, I have, uh, I'd love product X to rent that I don't see on your rental price list. Bring it on. We are always expanding our rental offerings. That's not a problem. Um, and then some other specific questions about updates to specific um, uh, software. Um, those are a little unique. I think that we may try to handle that at the end of the webinar here or uh, do a future one-on-one -on -one or something question came in about uh, some future updates, maybe to our Larson Davis DNA product, which is a great tool if you're doing repeated uh, reporting from any data that you take from, from a sound meter, or dosimeter, or human vibration meter. Um, so yeah, we'll send a link to the webinar or uh, the uh, modal shop in general is a big believer in, uh, we don't, we want to have permission based marketing. We don't want to flood your inbox with crap. So the newsletters are a fantastic way to stay up to date with everything. And you asking questions is a great way for us to make sure it has rich, usable content. Everybody, thanks so much. And um, 
we'll be doing this here in a bit over the pond, I think, um, for the European audience in a few months. So, as I say, feel free to continue with any questions you'd have, and we can always expand this because I think uh, we're going to be able to generate some rich content that will help everyone uh, in the future. Thanks again, everybody.